beyond the transactional order that people started thinking more than Troy should be doing. Uh, and Troy was also part of the accounting function, I think, one, you know, it was true then, it was not very independent. That's where once again the thought process came in, how can Troy uh, become independent? Because if you are dependent, you know, to that extent you will not have the objectivity. I think that's where the you know, need was felt, then the audit was separated and that's how we, as a part of the corporate governance, you know, the reporting was directed towards the audit committee, it was not to the CFO. But today, if you look at it, I think especially if I, if I just take about a 10 years journey, when the Sarbox came in in 2001, the focus significantly shifted from transaction based audit, from the process oriented audit to financial reporting. Because the SOX brought a significant you know, kind of uh, ownership on the directors, on the, you know, the management, to make sure that the financial statement reflected true and fair view. That's where I think many companies started using the internal audit function as to how we can get comfort in that area, what the internal audit can do much more uh, in that area. But, uh, you know, <coughs> off late, obviously that started. One of the biggest questions I think people started asking lately, let's say in 2010 11, when the whole credit crisis was happening, where were the internal auditors? What they were doing? Why it was not, you know, kind of identified and communicated up front? Because Many banks became bankrupt. You know, you know what happened in 2008 to 2010. Then once again, the, the, we the started reinventing in terms of what is that they are not doing properly. And if you look at it, I think the whole credit crisis can be quiet for two things. What went wrong? Essentially, two things went wrong in a big way. One was the governance itself. The governance function was there in the paper, but it was not effectively kind of operating at the entity level, or the company level, or the bank level, whatever it may be. Secondly, no much attention was given, detailed attention was given to risk management policies. See, every business has to define the risk appetite. If I don't really define the risk appetite, obviously I will do certain things which might take the an audience into bankruptcy. I think that's what exactly happened in the credit crisis. Nobody knew actually how much risk appetite the companies and the banks are taking or corporations are taking whether the risks are worth taking those risks or if they are taking the risk, what sort of architecture you must have to protect those risks or manage those risks. I think that's where the need was felt. The risk management policies, a very low attention has been given by stakeholders. Corporate governance effectiveness is once again now because of the question mark. And today still we are grappling with the issues. Today if you go to any audit committee, any board of directors, uh, obviously I think these are two big questions in their mind in terms of are we doing enough to identify our risks? Are we doing enough to monitor our risks? Are we doing enough to kind of manage our risk? I think that has become a real, real issue. And the other important thing, you know, when I'm talking about risk management, I'm talking about, you know, risk identification, the external market forces are changing quite drastically. I don't think, at least, you know, in my mind, we will never have certain times in our life now. We will grapple with uncertainty. Uncertainty of political uncertainty, it could be economic uncertainty, it could be natural disaster uncertainty. I think we are going to live with this uncertainty for, you know, for forever now. So especially I think the economic volatility and the regulatory expectation. Regulatory expectation is also changing. Because the problem today is no country has full control on the information, on the labor, on the capital. Unfortunately, I think that's where we are heading towards now. You might have boundaries for a country, but I think the factor of production, which is land, labor and capital, at least you don't have any at the country level, you don't, you can't really manage that. That's why I think after the credit crisis, the G20 first day kind of formed as to how can we, you know, we can really work together to identify how we need to manage because after globalization, everything is becoming impossible for one particular country to handle. I think this way, now, you know, a um, uh, lot more uh, coordination is happening globally amongst regulators. I think this just gives critical risk faced by the audit today because before I would jump into it, if you really look at it, I think, you know, in terms of the risk, regulatory complexity, as I said, I think obviously after the credit crisis, people are putting a big question mark on the regulation. Whether we have adequate regulations, whether the regulations are operating effectively, you know, uh, we conducted a survey, at least 77% of the folks say that look, I think regulatory complexity is increasing. For example, after the credit crisis, the banks were obviously now in globally, people, you know, regulators are working to break the banks. One is a traditional function, other is, you know, where they can do, take the proprietary actions or proprietary businesses. I think that's getting now right. Kind of diversified or broken up. So that's data security and privacy is becoming very, very important because the way technology is playing a role in today's, you know, in everybody's life, it's just 
making lot more, you know, uh, people are very, very worried about their security, data security and privacy. There are cost pressures. When I'm saying cost pressures, if you look at today's organization, at least when I talk to multinational companies, they are getting from a market which they knew very well to the market where they don't know that market particularly and for them to get the product at the right cost has become, you know, very, very important. Because most of these folks, multinationals, they know how to operate in the developed market. But when you want to operate in a developing market, you have to get your product cost drastically down. You know, so otherwise you will not be able to kind of survive. So there is a cost pressure. I particularly work in the automotive sector. So I think people knew how to build a car in thirty thousand dollars because they were asked to build a car in two thousand dollars. They don't know how to do that. There is enormous amount of cost pressure. And then you also have the policy changes. The common policies frequently changing because as I said, the land different capital they are under control, they are putting patches wherever they require, unfortunately. So you see a lot of regulations. You look at the US, plenty of regulations have come in after the credit crisis, they brought the Dodd Frank Act, which is like a thousand page legislation, very complex legislation. And in Indian context also we've seen a lot of changes in the corporate governance of the including companies act. Now you also have the talent availability, which has become an extremely you know, difficult task for people to get, you know, talent. Then changing customer behavior, that is putting a complete different pressure on the organization. Suddenly you realize that what you have been manufacturing is not allowed in the marketplace. So I think that's because it's, you know, the changing customer preference is very, very, you know, it's becoming very vocal now. Organization is other area where I think, you know, especially at least in the Asian context, in last 10 years almost about 250 million people have moved from rural to urban, 250 million is a pretty big number and next 20 or 30 years, people are expecting it. It's 500 people will move from rural to urban pockets, especially in countries like India and China. Just look at any what sort of opportunities and challenges that are bringing for the businesses. And shift in the competition. Because I think, you know, it's all this uh, more or less certain for businesses. The growth is not going to come from the developed de de market, you know. It's also only going to come from the developing market. So the entire shift is now changing. In terms of, if we really look at the numbers, uh, you know, the GDP numbers, let's at least last three or four years, the significant growth in the GDP number has come from the developing market, especially countries like India, North, uh, sorry, in the countries like China, which was just about 10 years back, is about 4 to 5 trillion dollars economy, today it's become a 10 trillion dollar economy, the growth is coming from there. So that is bringing uh, other sort of challenges for the organization, emerging technologies, you know, and then so uncertainty which I talked about. So I think the business are lacking to it. So in, when you go through this kind of environment and take the employee, are the employee doing enough to understand the risk landscape? Are they just getting into transaction one day and just doing it and coming out of it, nothing will happen? Because I think the transaction audit has a lot of limitation. I, I, I don't say that you shouldn't be doing that, but that is a very small part of activity today. Because it's not about uh, you know, finding the faults, uh, the way I think people used to think. Today they are looking for the shift the way I have seen in Floyd that they used to just come up with the problems. Now organizations are saying that we need solution, you guys need to provide solution. So that is it. Now they are saying that you need to act as advisor. You need to be sounding board for us. So the role is completely changing from just bottom of pyramid where you just used to find the problems, then you went to solving the problems. Now you are becoming a strategic partner. They are increasingly looking, the board, the audit committee, the stakeholders are looking for an audit as a value advisor, someone who sees things much before they happen and tell us basically, they have sound advice to us. So to do that, I think, you know, you obviously have a lot of skill set. So I think that's where the, you know, the, um, the, the risk assessment becomes an extremely important. And in my mind, I think don't really understand where the organization is going towards. The really organization has a strategy in place. As an employer, if you really don't know the strategy what the organization is ready for, then you will not be able to really you know, manage the risk. For example, if I to go back once again to the credit crisis, many banks started selling the product without relying on the product, what sort of risk they're giving. And employees are not aware of the risk. The different product, the subprime mortgages, which we, you, know, you, you, you all know about it, what happened with subprime mortgages. People, people are selling this product. The internal audit or even the board or even the uh, audit committee, they're not aware of what sort of risk this product will bring to the organization. So that is not there. So I think this way that, you know, is because people, uh, the internal especially, never spend a lot of time in understanding the strategy, where the organization is heading towards. That is now becoming extremely important. And one of the points here, I think, which is increasingly becoming challenging, that 
the global trade and financial market and supply chains are all integrated. When you talk about risk assessment, it's impossible for you to do unless you really understand the landscape vis-à-vis -vis the company or the uh, organization strategy. And I'm predicting we have talked about environment factors also becoming the extremely important privacy breaches. Um, culture challenges because when organization moves from developed to developing market, different culture challenges are coming. And the speed at which things are happening, things like you know, social media reputations. So the risk profile is changing. You know, when you talk about the whole thing. And, and as accelerators, we also grapple with many of these things when you start thinking about the audit strategies to so what we need to do. So that's also you know applicable to um, the market. I think off rate, at least in this chart, it depicts you know some of the most cited risk in the risk assessment. When you know I work many of the board audit committees, you know, both in India and globally, some of these are coming very, very prominent. One is economic uncertainty itself. You really don't know whether business is going to do well or not going to do well. And if you really look at last uh, you know three or four years, at least what two to three years, there are three factors which are impacting the global economy and they all have impact on your financials, they all have impact on the company strategy, they all have impact on people like us, consumers also. What are those three or four key challenges in the global economy today? Why I am saying that it is extremely important to understand to do a risk assessment. So one challenge, the most important challenge is basically the unconventional monetary policy what the central banks are following after 2008, which is nothing but they are dumping the money into the economy. The money supply has increased drastically in the last three or four years. So that is bringing a different challenge altogether. The interest rates are reduced significantly. Just imagine interest rate reduction, what sort of impact it has on the social security funds all over the world. They are not able to really, you know, earn interest. And off late last one year, they are penalizing, you know, it's not that central bank will charge you money if you keep money with the bank, which is called negative rate of interest. In RBI, when bank goes and deposit, they get some money. But globally, like countries like Japan or European Union or even the, uh, to America also, if the bank keeps money with the, uh, the central bank, central bank is charging interest to the bank for keeping the money, whole tax, viewers. Because the unconventional monetary policy which they are following to keep the economy alive. So I think that's one of the risks which is impacting everywhere. You see sudden shift in the stock markets. The moment there is some news that the US Treasury is talking about raising the interest rate. The whole market collapsed globally next morning. Because you know, a lot of people have flowed from US to developing economies. If interest rate goes up there, the money will go back there. So I think one is the unconventional monetary policy, which is having a significant impact on almost all businesses. The second is the commodity prices, which are playing a role for government industry at least. The oil and gas industries or steel industries. I think you know, that's, that's another area where I think things are becoming extremely difficult for companies to manage their you know, cost and manage their, uh, the, the risk. And the third thing, you know, if you really look at in this entire uh, camera of thing, the China slowdown. The China slowdown has a significant impact on many economies across the globe. Many economies were depending on China for a lot. For example, if you took, uh, take the today at least South America, the whole of the economies are spreading. You take Chile, you take uh, Argentina, you take Brazil, you take Russia, or you take the entire Middle East. You know, nobody expected Middle East will have a physical deficit. At least in my mind, I spent almost six to seven years in the Middle East. I never expected that those countries will have physical deficit. But today, Saudi is running 12%. You know, so I think those are changes which are happening. So uncertainty has become very difficult. These all people think that they don't have impact on financial statement or something. They will have impact. That's why it's very important for employment to think strategically where the organization is heading towards. What sort of risks are surfacing, you know, which you are going to have. Talent I spoke about in labor, new product in production. Because today every organization is struggling, what sort of product I need to have? When the guy is global, uh, let me once again relate with the uh, automotive company where I spent a significant amount of time. You know, most of the European Union and European OEMs, all the American OEMs, they don't want to manufacture cars. But they don't want to manufacture a small car for a country like India. That's why Maruti is still ruling. That's why I think uh, Honda is still ruling, because they have an expertise to manufacture a small car. If you talk to, you know, companies like Ford or companies like uh, GM or companies like uh, Volkswagen, they don't know, because they never thought a small car can be a valuable position. So the new product, you know, for example, what is happening when the FMG and I think the Patanji is taking on a couple of established brands. So these are going to just hit you nowhere, from nowhere. And if you are not on that radar in terms of that, for example, 
Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone, je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone, je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un smartphone. Je ne sais pas si je suis un So regulation I spoke about, reputation and brand, fraud and ethics. So unfortunately, this is now becoming one of the biggest risks in my mind. Just to give this kind of uh, you know, from um, global fortune fund companies, maybe about 15 years back, 15 or 20 years back, 60 or 70 percent of the compensation of the chief executive used to be fixed one. If I'm a chief executive officer, I used to get about 70 rupees or 100 fixed compensation or 80 rupees. Today, the variable is 80 percent. Fixing gets only 20 percent. Just amount of the, you know, his entire fate depends upon the quarterly results. And the life of a CEO today, at least in the developed market, is not more than two years. Like a guy will, will get fired and two to two and a half years, that's all about it. Imagine the amount of risk what he or she will take in the next two to three years. So that's where I think the ethics is now becoming a bigger question mark. So in that context, without understanding that risk itself, See, one of the findings came out, the bank collapses, apart from the risk management policies and big governance, executive pay was one of the biggest culprit for people to take and manage risk. People did, you know, multiple, uh, you know, they did lots, they took lots of risk and made lots of money. That's why there was stock exchanges, especially in the SEBI now, I think in terms of US, they are saying that if there is a restatement of the financial statement, all your bonds you need to pay back to the company. It's not coming India, I'll not be very surprised. Seven billion in the next one or two years here also. In today's corporate governance, we don't have it. But in the US, it's a loss came. If you have a restatement, whether you know that you are party to it or you're not party to it, you've got to reimburse the entire money what you've got from the stock opposition to the company. There's a lot of this. So I think that's where executive compensation has become one of the very, very important things. Employed, if I don't know that, it's impossible for me to do the audit. Because management order control is something which is extremely difficult to audit. So that's another area. <coughs> Competition is beginning, you know, once again a very different dynamics because all, all of a sudden new players are coming. Once again, I relate back to, to automotive industry. Nobody imagined, I think, all these guys even never imagined Google will come with autonomous driving. You know, Apple will come with autonomous driving. So suddenly I will not be in business at all because I never invested time or uh, money in that. If you look at dealers today, most of the dealers are starting to say that I knew that how to sell the vehicles. The car they was coming now. He's taking all the customers. I don't know how to sell or anything. Things are going to change. They're just going to change in a multiple direction. So competition. The market shift I talked about. Business continuity, once again, a bigger issue, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, your going concern, your strategy, financial market, you spend energy and commodity cost, you spend merging acquisition. They bring different kind of risk once again. So this way, I think the employer has to really understand what sort of strategy the company has. If the strategy itself is flawed, and if you don't identify that and communicate, I think, the survival of the organization is extremely difficult. Our last program risk, I think, when we do a lot of our investment. So I think some of these risks are now becoming very, very important. In, uh, so how is the landscape of the audit should look like? How does you know, new flow should look like with the audit? So if you really look at navigate the new risk and new risk landscape, landscape. as an audit, first of all, I think, you know, they have to really understand what's the landscape of risk. I am not talking about in a very minute detail like operational risk or financial risk, much bigger than that, but survival risk itself. So I think think and act strategically. They got to think strategically the way the organization is heading towards. What is the strategy? Where do you want to head towards? What are the risks associated with that strategy? If the strategy, if the strategy really goes downside, how, how we can manage or how the company can manage. And then align your resources and allocation because resources are going to be extremely scarce. So how you want to allocate the resources and how you want to really See which are the top risks which are facing the organization and how we can mitigate the risk. Leverage the second line of defense, which I said talked about in terms of if something goes wrong, what can happen? How can I really, you know, um, I can have an influence, the whole thing, you know, second defense. Provide people inside, understand the business. Without understanding business, product, distribution, network, competition, strategy, it's impossible to do any add any value because you will not be able to add any value. Deliver advice and best practices, which is what a trusted advisor. Delivery specialist. I think today specialists are becoming so important. It's impossible, you know. 
to, to kind of um, uh, do your on your own. Even, even as a partner sometimes, when I sit on the financial statement and think to, one thing hits me very you know, hard, I am responsible for my destiny, but my destiny is not in my control. The reason being, because there are so many values, fair valuations I have in the financial statement, I understand it's all in the cost. There is actually, there is a financial statement fair valuation, there is litigation fair valuation, there is a merger efficient valuation guide. So everything they are telling you that this is fine, and you are really consigning your luck to them ultimately. So there I think, you know, specialists are going to become very important. If you try to say that I can do everything, it's impossible. So you need to look at where is that gap we have. Do we have a gap where in terms of understanding? Otherwise it becomes extremely difficult to do. The other day I was just talking about the employer, he was doing the insurance adequacy test. A large organization, I spent some time with him. One thing I realized that he has no expertise to how to look at the adequacy of insurance. So I told him, boss, I think you are a very experienced person, but you are not capable to do this. Please hire someone and get it done. Otherwise, tomorrow something goes wrong, you will blame squarely. So I think specialist is one of the other area. And the cut through the cutters, I think basically how you really increase your dialogue. That's you know as employed, how you increase your dialogue with the CEOs, the CFOs, the audit committees or the board, or you know, in your some of your peers, which is extremely important. And simply by reporting, make it consumable. Because I think writing problems of report is not going to serve the purpose. I can communicate top three or top four risk very effectively rather than reporting 100 pages. You can probably report that. Sometimes I think your advice will get lost in the detailed reporting which I have seen that. So what are the eight core attributes? So focus on the critical risk and issues. For that you need to really understand the broader you know, movement which are happening around, whether it's a global economy, whether the businesses, you know, which are the top 10 or top 12 or whatever risk facing this organization. Right from your almost all, just our operation, you know, the challenge risk and financial risk. So focus on those risks and issues because that is the critical part. If you don't get that right, it's impossible to mitigate those risks because you are not identified this properly. Then align value proportion with stakeholders' expectation. See, stakeholders' expectations are increasing every year, day by day, because their responsibilities are increasing. Today, if you really look at like, across the globe, the independent directors are one of the most worried, you know, a lot. Because they are just worried because their responsibilities are present tremendously including India also. So obviously they have different expectations. The management expectations, the board expectations, then they, you know. Uh, and today, if you really look at it, you know, one of the things which hits me when I think the stakeholders with whom you don't have written contract are becoming more powerful. Let me just decode this whole thing what I'm talking about. Let me just put my own example. When you, set, you see a set of financial statement, you know that you have been hired by the members and the shareholders to do the audit. There is a written engagement letter is there, it's all fine, so you, you know. But <coughs> you have many stakeholders who are becoming more powerful with whom you don't have a contract. For example, government. Government expects that you know, this auditor will make sure the companies pay proper taxes. I don't have any contract with the Ministry of Finance, but he is expecting that. There's expectation built into it. For example, you don't have with the, you know, the regulator like SEBI, they have their own expectations from a, a party like the auditors, you know, maybe I think the auditor also. So the, then you have society at large. They, they have some different expectations. So when you start thinking about expectations, you know, there is consumer, employees, so the uncharted, you know, kind of the stakeholders are even more powerful in our management. So I think that's where you know really need to understand the expectations, otherwise it becomes extremely difficult to manage them. Match talent model to the value proposition. Because at the end of the day, when you have all of these things, do you have enough skill set with you? Do you have people with the deep expertise? Or do you have to really rely on third party? Engage and manage stakeholders' relationship. Apart from expectation, you need to also because sometimes I said from more experience, audit committee and management they have some different expectations on that. They think differently. So how do you really bring out the table on the common point? And then enable a client service culture. Because at the end of the day, although you are inside automation, I think your survival depend a lot more depend upon you know what sort of service culture. Cultures you are kind of you know, growing within that organization. And deliver cost effective services, once again, cost is going to leverage technology. This is one area I think there's a huge amount of transactions going to happen in the next maybe five or ten years. I think how much is going to really 
you know, people are going to automate is a question mark, but I think technology is going to play an effective role. Promote quality improvement and innovation. When businesses are going through innovation, you cannot sit idle and say that everything is fine what I am doing, whether it's external audit, internal audit, there is a lot of innovation which ought to have, which needs to happen, otherwise we will not be relevant in the marketplace, for sure. So innovation is a, you know, other important in terms of how you do it and what sort of improvement you need to require. So I think we did one survey just to see key barriers to rise to the new flow. Now I define the new flow, what the new flow should look like. So what is the, you know, um, the barriers? One of the biggest barriers is organizational culture resistance. When you do certain th new things, there's got to be culture resistance. That's where I think, you know, support of all people are required to help the auditors because auditors is not going to do alone. Lack of resources is becoming very critical. This is coming in all our surveys that internal audit chief or board or audit committees are saying that we don't have enough resources to understand our businesses, to understand our risks. So that is becoming lack of expertise, lack of magnet. Sometime I think the internal auditors when we talk to them, they don't have that magnet, that authority. That is now becoming, organizations are increasingly looking at it. That's why the organizations are not doing it. Regulators took in their hand. They said that, look, audit committee guys cannot report to CFO. They need to report to audit committee. Because they knew that, I think, things are not happening, at least in the U.S., they directed that you have to report directly to audit committee. Because they know that if I go to I report to CEO, the independence and comp comp I may be competent, but objectivity might get impaired. So I think lack of magnet, but that is now becoming less issue, at least for the listed entities, because regulations have changed. Lack of awareness of internal audit capabilities. People are sometimes not aware of it and lack of budget. So some of these you know, barriers which are coming through and many companies are working towards that, uh, you know, in terms of how to... <coughs> Let's, in the same uh, survey, we also went through in terms of the risk perception and stakeholder expectation. You can see global in India. We spoke to a number of audit committees, internal auditors, CEOs, CFOs, you know, in terms of where they are doing well, where they are not doing well. If you look at you know commercial market shift in Indian context, internal auditors in India never focus on that area at all, on businesses. That means still we are very traditional, process-driven, transaction-oriented audit that is changing globally. Globally, if you see, I think not well managed is only 59%. Still, there's a huge amount of you know efforts are required. At least 40% of the respondents say that our internal auditors are managing the commercial market shift. They understand our strategy much better. But in Indian context. 88% say that we are not managed well because either the internal audit mandate doesn't include or the internal audit doesn't have the capability to go towards that. I think th that's where most, you know, um, most uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, most of the board and audit committees are now asking the internal auditors to take a deep look at it, the strategies of the companies and look at the market shift. Business continuity. In Indian context, once again, internal audit is not really worried about business continuity. But globally, after the credit crisis, Business continuity is one of the key areas where employees have been asked to focus. Will I, will, I, will I survive in next, you know, one year? Merger acquisition. Globally, I think whenever the M&A happens, the internal auditors are asked to play a greater role in that entire an activity and the transition. But in Indian context, that is not happening. Once again, the risk gets identified. If you look at, once again, fraud and ethics, there, globally, the percentage is 65. In India, still we believe um, you know, internal audits are not really going that extra mile to, to kind of detect the fraud. Uh, government spending and other activities, that's, you know, that's one area where the thing in India is not you know, too much exposed. But if companies are dealing with the government, uh, you know, what, what sort of framework the organizations have? Because uh, many times I think especially there are a lot of facts in the US or in India also, especially around corruption. When your organization is primarily driving, with, uh, driving the business from government, one of the presumed risks is the corruption risk how the organization is handling that. So that could be another area. Large program risk, I think when you do large investment, economic uncertainty. If you look at almost all parameters, I think globally things are improving, but in India still I think there's a lot of focus, there's a lot of uh, you know, area where the employer has to really focus in terms of addressing some of the risks. But uh, at least there is awareness. I think today one good, good thing about, uh, you know, when I speak to people or you know, the problems with the audit committee, some of the things are changing quite fast. The expectations are quite changing fast and Lord is also focusing quite a lot in that area. I think the other one, once again here also, uh, if you really look at the global versus uh, Indian context, still I think, uh, you know, globally a lot of things are happening, but in India still I think we are lagging behind in almost all parameters. So 
if you are heading into auditor you know you need to ask this question when you when you really draw your plan your vision of internal audit where are we actually in terms of because we need to take out the hat of transaction audit which is anyway we need to do it but there you can leverage technology a lot i think that's what globally what is happening the most the check and balances work which ought to you know people used to do what today which we are doing here they have leveraged all this system technology data analytics is playing a huge role then they are able to free their time to think about strategic risk of the company where the company is heading towards and what are the risks associated with that are we doing enough in that area are we communicating that enough to stakeholders uh, i think that's something which uh, you know increasingly i think when i was part of one or two you know us multinational um, in fact i have seen introduced challenging the chief executive on the strategy itself in the last thing what three months back i was in one audit committee the introduced chief was saying that you are just going for disaster very important conversation and the audit committee had its own view they said if the risk is so high let's take a pause here let's look at the specialist let's involve and let's see are we taking enough are we taking the risk which we can mitigate or manage so that sort of shift is happening today you know today i think the ceo is also afraid of a, the chief in auditor with the guy is very capable he could put him on his feet so there is checks and balances every company is trying to build on that and this may not this is not happening in india now but it might happen increasingly because when i think the independent directors want that sort of you know insight from the internal auditor so i think in one second in the survey i think which are the risk you know to little attention from internal auditor this is both you know global and india you can see in large proportion i think quite a few areas where they are not really getting those that much of attention things like you know competition uh, economic uncertainty so that means still i think you know the the amount of time which employees are spending on the mundane activities is still very high very very high so with all this happening around you know the internal audit is due itself there yeah so yeah I think you know if you are working with audit committee, it's extremely really important to have that conversation with audit committee. It's not that we are going to challenge their strategies. It's not going that we are going to run the business. Our our you know scope is very limited. We want to understand the risk. Even the chief executive officer also well. sometimes they may resist. But if you put yourself in the his or her shoes and communicate that, the chances of you or she buying will be very high because end of the day you are trying to protect them. you are not trying to have different agenda in politics this many them all happen the way you communicate the way you communicate is so important put that other person into the context otherwise it becomes very difficult the ego clash will come through so i think that's where we one taking the support from the audit committee taking the support from some of the directors going back to the ceo and saying that look i think the whole exercise is going to only help you we are going to identify the risk and leave to you Employee will not decide what sort of appetite of the risk we company should have. It's up to the board. The board will decide what risk they want to take. But the key for employee is that whether you have identified all those risks. Do you know all those risks? Do you know what the you know downside of those risks if something goes wrong? If you do that and then present that data to the board, they definitely will look at it in terms of up to which you want to take the risk. Because in any business you want to take the risk. The only thing is that you should know your mind should know what risk you are taking. As long as you are clear in that, nobody will blame you at least as employers. I think this is a huge problem at least in Indian context. The globally is changing. After credit crisis, the CEOs also increasingly asking help from the employers. Do you know whether we are doing right here? Because they have to write their strategy because things are changing. Whether to be in the business or not in the business, it's a big, big kind of a thing. So you know, and you really don't know whether that business what you are there today. Tomorrow, that business will still be there. You don't know that. One second to give an example. I work with many automotive clients in uh, in India because I have been working with this industry for the last 10 to 15 years. When you talk about your conventional engine, which is called ICE, when that engine goes away in electrical vehicles, the entire component of the engine will be available. For example, if I am manufacturing spark plugs, 
After five years, I don't know who will buy his passport if electrical waiter comes in. It's not relevant. So those sort of insights are very important for them as well. Whether my business is going to be viable tomorrow because of land, changing landscape. So I think, yes, he's resistant, but you need to. For that to happen, I think, friends, the more important that you have to stick to yourself. The one thing which worries me, do I know enough? Do I do enough in reading the material? Do I understand? That question mark always back of my mind. So your preparedness has to be in that level. Just imagine if you are going to, you know, kind of sort of challenge someone who runs the business day in day out, you at least have to have the knowledge equal to that guy. If not, then you will fail. You will not be able to convince them. I think that's why we need to kind of see whether are we doing enough in terms of training ourselves. <laughs> No, if you really don't make them understand what are you trying to do, then I think that conversation becomes very limited. See, I'll tell you, many times when I, uh, this is slightly, I'm, I'm just taking away. When I qualify the account, one of the questions was asked to me that, how do you have good relationship with the CEO till you qualify the account? I told the, you know, one of, some of my colleagues, I don't go to CEO and say that I'm qualifying your account. I tell him that you are going to sign this financial statement. Forget about auditor first, sign me. I'm his turn for you right now. With all these issues, are you comfortable signing a receipt at the office on your account? Many a times he said, no, I'm not comfortable. Your answer is, that's all, you have solved the problem. You qualify the account and come out of it. You can make him understand. Because the risk is not only mine, the risk is also his. So many a times I think we need to get that act. How can I put the other guy into the center of stage here? and make him understand through his own language. The chances of you succeeding are very high. So I think that's where the challenge is always there. I think you need to really do that. And increasingly, at least people are now understanding that how important that activity is. Now they are looking at internal slightly differently. The problem where it comes in, why people sometimes don't give information, if they believe the person is not having that skill set to assess, there the problem comes in. That's where you need to really see, I think, how much you want to do on your own or how much you want to really get someone on your board. I think that's the conversation I think you need to have in the employment, whether, internal, whether you are doing through the firms or whether you are doing through, you know, in the own department or, you know, in the independent firm. I think there are two important things I just want to, you know, highlight here. If you look at the definition, we've changed a lot. I have not put that definition into this, the journey of the definition of internal auditors from the Institute of Internal Auditors, but I think this is the latest one. What is that talks about? Just look at, I think, the words I'm going to hi highlight. One is the independent, objective assurance, consulting activity, which is nothing but a advisor. These three new words have come in, in the definition. You know, which is um, basically, I think, is extremely important, and it goes to the last, effective of risk management. Risk management is a very small word to understand the risk. It's impossible today to understand all the risks without, you know, spending a lot of time. Control and governance. So I think basically, the, the, you know, the mindset and how you really carry out your engagement. And then the next one, if you look at it, enhance and protect organizational values by providing risk-based and objective assurance, advice and insight. Once again, it talks about objective assurance. You are going to have an independent thought process. Because objectivity is extremely important in internal audit. If there is no objectivity, then you will not add any value because you need to have your own independent view. And that can only come, I think, the internal audit really, you know, spend time in equipping themselves with skill sets, which is, which is very, very important. <coughs> Once again, I think the Institute also talks about in you know, a couple of um, principles, the core principles, and they also have undergone a change here. Demonstrate integrity. It's very easy to say that, but I think doing is important. You know, sometimes it, it poses challenges. But without, I think, demonstrating integrity, it's extremely difficult to get the uh, support from all the stakeholders. Competence and due professional care. Competence is the one word which is sometimes misused. To become competent, the amount of effort what you need to do is enormous. What is that you are doing to develop your own skill set? When I'm saying skill set, I'm just not talking about a technical skill set. Technical is given. What are you doing to improve your soft skill set? Which I talked just now. I talked about the communication. What are you doing to improve your skill set on the, you know, global activity? How things are operating. So I think that's very very important. You know, 
and align with the strategy objective and risk of organization because in internal audit they, they really need to un, you know align go back with the strategy of the organization if you understand the strategy you understand the risk better if you understand the risk better then you understand what is that you need to do to mitigate those risks so it's all linked actually and then a properly positioned and adequate resources i think this is one area in india is still the problem but globally it is of change are happening now i think increasingly the audit committee and the board are making sure the independent chief internal auditor is pretty powerful guy they making him very very important in the whole game of things because you know you can't give someone responsibilities or authority it's not going to really operate i think they all realize quality and continuous improvement as employed i think you need to have your own kpis communication is very important this is what i talked about how effectively you can communicate because at least i've seen you know people who have done the work and not communicating effectively the impact will not be there you know and this space assurance is talk inside project and future focus future focus is the word i think owners is focused on the business are going you know changing pretty drastically this where i think when you start the, you, know, you understand the strategy the future focus is very important you know the right there is no right or wrong answer at least you need to assess the appetite of the risk and some more organizational improvement i think this is some of the i think core principle which the intellect the institute is talking about and you know some of the foundation attributes once again i think when you talk about is the you know quality and innovation which is once again extremely important uh, from um, i think a lot of standards are coming through uh by some intellectual institute and stuff like that uh, i think that's other area you know and formal quality assessment what you do and innovation i talked about service culture the matrix major customer satisfaction end of the day i think you have different stakeholders when you do an audit you need to go back because at least i believe that process really add value as to where you need to improve upon because that if, it, if that doesn't happen then obviously you will not get you know where they you are doing well and where you are doing you are not doing very well objectivity and value i think you need to have right balance between objectivity and value so your independent mindset and value both i think that's something very difficult to achieve in some cases but i think you need to try hard strategic support i spoke about strategic plan once again function specific feedback regularly that's fine i think you know some of these things only will bridge the gap between the expectation and what you are doing the whole exercise here is that how can you bridge the gap and cost effectiveness which i have spoke about in terms of how you measure the productivity do you have audit methodology which is consistent standard and simplified people understand what they're doing and invest in the audit infrastructure you know basically the training part of it which is extremely important um, you know to do that so that your skill sets are always up to the mark i think this i talked about you know in terms of the business alignment i think this is where the area i see lot of improvements are required globally also in india also because intel audit still doesn't focus too much on that part because somehow they think it's not in their scope some of them think it's not very important but you know they really realize and especially after this uh, credit crisis this has become extremely important to understand that bit technology uh, data analytics and are deployed now i think increasingly they've been deployed um, and you know other thing is that leveraging governance risk and compliance i have seen many times in indian context when companies do you know erm internal plays very less role in that i don't know why company is called enterprise risk management system but the main guy who is supposed to monitor and manage the risk is missing sometimes globally i think it's changing but india also is changing at least in the bigger companies but i think that will have to change i think if you need to really understand and you know this is a big risk this focus we have talked about top risk strategy you know and the bottom for the portfolio today i think most of the you know work is done through bottom up is not on the top risk because the strategy this doesn't get you know flow into the goals uh, you know assessment Uh, an emerging risk which I have talked about, talent model, which is once again a critical. You know, many companies what they are doing now, um, at least for the key position in Lloyd, they they rotate people. The person works in marketing, he works in production, he works in finance. So he's all round role, and then he goes back to Lloyd because he need to understand the organization much better. That is what's happening in India. Still, it's not part of, but globally, at least I have seen the guys who are in Lloyd, in Lloyd. They really, you know, kind of spend a lot of time in the different departments just to understand. And conflict management, critical thinking is also because a lot of times the conflict comes from, as I said, from different directors, board, audit committee, management. How do you manage the conflict? That also is a skill set by itself. And for that, I think you need to be really tactical in terms of the way you handle it and how you really communicate the risk for different stakeholders and what is that you are doing to mitigate the risk overall. Because then, really, I think the shareholders, the audit committee, or management, their entire objective is finally, I think, to have sustainable business. Performance and feedback. Lastly, then, one is that 
you know, influence the office of the shifting from financial compliance areas to CFO agenda. Especially I've seen, I think, when you have merger acquisition and some of these things, the CFOs are increasingly asking employees to take a good look at it. Impact on value creation, whether your organization is really creating the value or where are they you know, in terms of. In fact, uh, I was in one of the audit committee recently. Uh, the internal audit were asked to look at uh, how the company structured its business model and uh, whether the business model is uh, legal and whether the business model is ethical. So I'm just thinking this very really, different director of audit. What is it legal? Is it ethical? You are asking that question. Are you guys not paying taxes legally or ethically also you are finding that area? So I think such kind of things are coming up in the audit committees. That's our value creation activity. Can you share some insights on how globally audit committees are looking at the effectiveness of the internal audit? I think you see two or three things, the dimension they are looking at in a show. One, I think when you, when you look at internal audit assessment, first of all they are really looking at whether internal audit itself has understood the company's business and family risk. How much they really know about that? In terms of you know their uh, overall uh, activities, what they do with the executive management. So our focus is given that area. In fact, the entire assessment is done with the chief employers just to understand how the chief employer perceives the risk coming out of the strategy. That means, I, for example, the entire focus is that how do you identify the risk? What is your process for identifying the risk? That's where I think more and more audit committees are focusing on it. Because the end result they are fine. I think how much work you have done, that is something later on you can focus. But I think the more and more um, you know, assessment is you know, kind of uh, centered around how much employee will know about the company, company strategy, competition, business, changing trend, role of technology, and what sort of risk it is bringing to the table for the company. Are there any metrics involving Yeah, there are metrics. They are metrics. People use structured kind of assessment. They have a QA type of assessment. And then what the audit committees do, when the audit committee chair meets with employers, he will form an opinion whether the chief employer knows enough about the company business or not. This is increasingly a you know, one of the communications they have normally. Before the audit committee comes in, I think when the employer comes and presents his agenda, what he wants to cover. Before that, I think private meetings are happening to assess the risk. They are trying to match their expectation with the risk assessment what the employer has done. So they use the matrix, increasingly. They will use the matrix. And then there's very, I think, more and more focus and a lot of coaching within the your community chair. Look, I think you need to look at some of these risks differently. You need to factor some of these risks differently. So I think that's assessment has been done. But it's not very, it's dependent on organization to organization. Because some industries are highly regulated. So obviously the ability to comply is also back of their mind. So it all depends. But yes, they are doing, and end of the day, I think every audit committee effectively assesses every year whether the internal audit is effective or not. And in that, to your answer, uh, you know, increasingly, I think the globally audit committees believe employees are only playing a role up to 60 percent, 60 to 65 percent. So still, they feel the gap is there, 35 percent, and the gap is essentially coming out from the not understanding enough about the markets, about the industry, about the regulation, about the strategy, I think that's where they are coaching. Because under the day, if you look at most of the business which have created in the last 10, 12 years, they have just nothing to do with the process internally. It's all to do with the risk of time which I talked about in the day. They are doing that. So still there's huge, uh, you know. In fact, I think it's not been increasingly asked to validate the strategy itself. Which I used to see that earlier. When the executive management goes and presents to audit committee, they say that this is what my risks are, this is what my strategies are, this is what I intend to do, this is what my risk capital. Uh, generally, audit committee is saying that can you take a good look at it to employees and come back to us. And employees are going and hiring people outside and trying to you know understand whether the executive management has understood all this properly or not. It's a very very you know deep dive exercise which is happening now. Fraud is also obviously increased focus is always there. Uh, and everything is integrated to the squad and what the company believes in. I think this is where I think when they do the assessment, we look at the every company has going through the transformational you know, journey today in their businesses. 
And obviously, Intel audit has been increasingly asked to you know, kind of commit for evaluation in this whole activity. And still, if you can see the percentage, it's not quite there in terms of experimentation. Still, I think only 47 provide a proactive perspective on exploration and control, control before risk happens. So, increasingly, the ask is very simple. Can you tell me something before that event happens? I don't tell, you don't tell me after event happens. I don't need that. You know, the shift, the mind shift is working. Because earlier the mind shift is that you identify the problem and come to me. Now, no, I, you, 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 there's no way there that you go and identify the problem and come. Can you tell me something? What can it be tomorrow? In, in just to give you context, I think you know, people are now asking, you know, when I sit, let's say, on IFC into control of financial reporting, when you look at the control matrices, increasing people are asking, you know, to tell me what the impact control environment looks like. How many manual controls I have in the whole processes? How many automated controls I have? How many preventive controls I have? How many detective controls I have? That's what questions have been asked. Because obviously audit committees or the board, they don't really want to depend too much on manual controls. Because the quality of manual control to a lot extent depends upon the quality of person. They want to see how can we prevent the control. If I were to see the this matrix when I started, you know, the stocks in 2004, we used to see 80% manual control or at least 70% manual control. Today, the manual control people say it should be more than 20%. I don't want to see more than 20% manual control. And where the manual controls are? Essentially in the areas of accounting estimates. A complex accounting estimate, I want to see one or two level of rigorous manual control. Otherwise, I really want to see priority control. I, want, I don't want to see detective control. So the landscape is changing. The whole purpose is that I don't want to know the risk after it occurs. I want to know the risk much before, which is a you know, thought process which is going around. And often, I think if you really look at some of these things in, in terms of, uh, you know, where the uh, internal audits are contributing, at least globally, the business continuity, they are really focused heavily now. In terms of, apart from the strategy on business continuity, data privacy, including cyber security, which is a huge area of concern, <coughs> including India, and data analytics, which I've talked about. And supply chain is also bringing a lot of risk to it. Internal audits have been asked to play, you know, uh, role. Uh, you know, for example, I was just, uh, you know, you know uh, gone through quite a few examples in that area. Increasing audit is asking that if you are importing, keep importing. And they're asking the question on the supply side, how sustainable this model is? What will happen to currency fluctuation? Are you going to absorb or how you're going to you know, react to that? So that's also, I think, a huge amount of change that's happening around in that area. So I think if I really understand and, you know, kind of consolidate into one particular slide, this probably gives some uh, you know, if you really do some of this groundwork, uh, you will probably understand, I think, one is the greater likelihood of achieving the company's objective. If you understand this clearly, then you know the likelihood of achieving the objective, how much likelihood you have or you don't have. So that to come, uh, clearly comes through that. Uh, consolidation reporting of desperate risk at broad level, which are the desperate risk is bad is taking. But I'm saying desperate risk, the business is changing so fast, they have no other option about taking the desperate risk. Yes, you can take those risks, but you know the downside of it. Understanding the key risk has their wide implication. Because the focus is just not on the financial reporting or not on operation, the wider risk it has. If I am doing something, you know, let's for example, today the risk is, uh, one example I say in the audit committee of asking about the structure, it's not an Indian company, it's a global company. What I think the board, the audit committee and the board, uh, you know, perception was that, if you keep dodging taxes, do you think customer will like you tomorrow or they'll throw your product in the market? Because, for example, once again, uh, Starbucks, you all know, I think, you know, that. Uh, in, in the UK, I think Starbucks, I think, uh, their sales dropped by almost 6 to 70 percent. When the UK government publicized that, you know, Starbucks is not paying taxes in the UK. Customers started, they stopped going to Starbucks, thinking that this company is not responsible company for this country. Just imagine the implication what it had. So I think that's where they are understanding the wider implication of you or something. If your name comes in the newspaper, how does it look like? That's a very critical question for the business continuity. It's nothing to do with their financial reporting. The financial reporting is fine, but you don't have a business tomorrow. So that's not wider implication of their own. Don't just assess the risk from the one or two category of the people. Risk take the risk with a broad you know context. If you are not paying taxes rightly, how does the regulator look like? Look towards you. So 
So increasingly, I think people are you know, grabbing the questions. And also, I think from a business perspective, it's my personal view. I think if the business is not socially responsible, I doubt they will survive for long. That's my assessment in the next 10, 20 years. If they don't behave socially, if they don't do right things, they will not be the business. Customers will punish them because today's customers are far beyond the people like you are because they understand much better. So they want socially responsible companies. So that is becoming extremely important. So I think in fact people are now thinking about because increasingly people are saying what's my purpose in life? As a company, what's my purpose? Making money cannot be purpose in life. That's one of the purpose. But that cannot be alone purpose. Like 10, 15 years back used to think. Today I know I don't want to leave the company. The chief executive came to the conference call. You would have imagined you know, what sort of questions is going to be asked in the shareholders meeting. He said we have made 40% margin in our business and it's doing extremely well. So one of the <coughs> shareholders asked basically, yeah, thank you very much, you think you are making money, but you keep saying that you are using costly raw materials, you are using a lot of different things. Do you think you are cheating the customers? How the customers look like? Do they think they will believe you tomorrow? Just imagine that question, chief executive have expected from a shareholder. So I think it's going in that direction. In fact, after that, the CEO said in the interview, I never imagined this at all. I think, you know, he, he was basically saying that I'm making more money because I've invested in research and development. He didn't communicate that very well. So I think, you know, that's just where I think the wide implication of you saying something. Uh, cross businesses, because the markets are very different. Uh, and greater management focus on the issue that really matters to them, I think it's very important. And ultimately nobody is expecting the crisis or surprises. Right thing in the right way, I think in the first place is where I think you know, they are expecting employer to play a role. And increased likelihood of change initiative being achieved, whatever the change initiatives have been done, whether due to merger acquisition, due to you know, reorganization, whether the employers are doing you know, work in that area. And obviously greater risk for greater reward, I think how that has been whole managed. I, I, Give an example of chief executive officers' salaries becoming more and more variable compared to fixed. Informed risk taking and decision making. I think this is very important. Risk will all have to take in life. Do you take informed risk? I think that's where the bigger question mark I think, today. It's still 35 to 40 percent of the audit committee believes organizations are taking the risk without really understanding the you know, impact of the risk in the near to long term. I think that's where the question is coming, and increasingly. They are asking employers supporting their data. <coughs> and other things they are also asking the governance structure. Because governance unfortunately has been there for, for the last 20, 20 years. But still we see some big ticket frauds. So I think that what increasing the audit committees are asking that we are not interested in paper governance. We are really interested in the governance which operates at the ground level. Are you happy on that? You know, that sort of questions are coming. In fact, I think uh, today the audit committee and the board, they themselves are evolving. And they are evaluating themselves. Are they doing enough? You know, are they really monitoring those activities? They map the company's problem. So in that context, I think internal audit committee you are asked to give advice or maybe comment on the effectiveness of the audit committees. This two-way process. Internal audit is evaluated by the audit committee. Audit committees are evaluated based on some of the recommendations by internal auditors, how they look at it. So that's happening now. More than compliance function, you know, that's study is more of the compliance function as well as go away from the you know, mindset. A strategy I spoke about. And uh, you know, I just want to touch base which I'm not really. What is the third line of difference? The third line of difference is basically do you have what enough resources? First and second. If first is basically you understand your risk. You understand your risk, you know the survey, you know, the inverse of the risk, the first, you know, and you know the mitigation plan what you have. The third, second line of defense is basically assume that the risks are there you are mitigating but those mitigation plans are not working for some reason. What next do you have? Do you have something else to you know, that doesn't operate? If that control doesn't operate? If that particular strategy is not operating? What is the next line of defense you have? Do you have anything else or you don't have anything else? So I think that's where you know, people are looking for two layer, you know, two layer of approval, two layer of response to your risk. Earlier used to see only this guy have, this is my mediation plan. People used to stop asking questions. Now after all this 
changes which are happening you know, globally in the business environment, those controls what you identify or the mitigation plan what you identify, some time are not working. Then people are figuring out what is that we need to do. Now they are increasingly asking if something this doesn't happen, what is the second level of defense we have, what are the controls we have, what are the mitigation plans we have. That's where I think a lot more discussions are happening now. I think that's, that's, that's where I think looking at risk holistically and for example, if I have to really, let's say for example, uh, uh, you know, one company which we are talking about that uh, it used to, the supply chain I spoke about, other companies that are working with them, they used to predominantly import their components from Japan. Then they said, okay fine, uh, we will also uh, import some components from Thailand. Unfortunately that year, both Japan got it, Thailand got it. And this is awareness, yeah. this is a management responsibility. Yeah. Then risk to mitigation. Whose responsibility? No. Risk awareness is management responsibility to employ to have to add value. Okay. That's a wrong understood. Yeah. Now, here specifically you are saying IA has got the third line of defense. And because if they ask the question whether management has really done that work, if they are not done the work, then they can go back to audit committee and say, look, it all looks fine, but if something goes wrong, we don't know what to do. The IA will not do that work. I will point the advice to management. Do you have anything else to mitigate that? At least that question has been, you know, increasingly audit, uh, into audits are asking the uh, management. That really never to happen. More awareness in terms of, you know, because, see, as I said, it's a, the shift is very simple from fault finding, that's how the entire functioners looked at it. Then they said, problem solver, you need to find the, you know, fault also, try to solve the problem, I think you solve the problem. Now they're saying you need to be trusted advisor to that's where I think, you know, that, that yeah. I think understanding business just spoke about it. Now, coming just, I think, just take a look at in terms of uh, use of analytics and technology in the audit. I think this is the only area where, at least I think I've seen increasing effort by internal auditors, uh, you know, they're using technology in almost all area. One is the enterprise risk management. In that assessment, technology is being used effectively, annual audit, Risk assessment, when you do your risk assessment of different different units or different, you know, geography, risk monitoring, business need or cycle, profiling, technology is being used effectively in that area. So that if any surprise happens, you get a you know update on that, based on that. So uh, technology is being used, uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, one in Florida, I know global in Florida, I was just sitting with him. He, was, he showed me a dashboard. Any political event happening in any country, you will get an alert. He is not managing business, he is obviously managing the risk. So he was basically saying that I want to know because we have businesses across the globe. If there is a political upgrade in one country, how does it impact me in terms of all? Not only from that country perspective, the global operation itself. So I think you know that technology is kind of used effectively on that. Project level risk, I think technology is used, audit pre-planning, huge technology, data analytics and you know stuff like that, scoping and planning, risk attributes happening. I think that's once again, in fact one uh, test is that I think, uh, you know, when a company, one of the employed, uh, you know, uh, function, I mean the way they design is, if a company is making much more money than what competition is doing, they really go back and analyze the specific reasons and understand the impact of it. Because for example, if the industry in which I'm operating, let's say it's making 10% margin, but my company is making 25% margin. That 15% is coming from where? They go so much detail. And then they conclude that there are no fraudulent transactions here. These are one, two, three, four things. I think that's all the things which is happening around to help of technology. multi unit auditing, data driven testing, 100% coverage summary you are doing, process control and result validation you are once again using technology, root cause identification technology is used, audit execution and reports, issue dashboard, you know, I've seen this issue dashboard. I've seen many internal functions globally. I think you know, if they have, let's say, 20 or 30 entities, they clearly tell you which are the entities where this perceived risk is very high, and why it is high, what are they trying to do in those areas. Uh, you know, then compliance metrics, analytical validation. So, effectively, this technology is going to become increasingly become relevant in internal audit. So, what probably will happen in future? The internal audit will be asked to play a major role as a business partner not the compliance zone, because some of the compliance zones will be taken care of by the technology, if you have well-defined processes. 
And if you're using technology, I think your data just can do that extent become. You know, because today you really don't have to do sampling. If I can get 100% confirmations or some sort of confidence through the data analytics, then I'll reduce my efforts there. I'll reduce my efforts somewhere else where I think the big data risks are. I think that's what's happening to the technology. And increasingly, audit committees are asking questions as to how much technology you're using and what is that you're doing with your spare time. Where are you investing? Where are you, which, you know, what's your risk you're looking at it? I think there's all these things, tools you know. The one area which is happening, I think, off late is the artificial intelligence. The AI is embedded in the process so much that itself will do all the, you know, checks and balances and throw them away. For example, if I, I have the AI intelligence, the, let's say I'm doing the purchase test thing, the report tells me that every purchase is matched by three with match accepting these transactions. You know, so notice the system itself is doing that check and balances. So I think this is going to become increasingly used uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, contract. I think contracts are really, I think, where technology is being used effectively, especially if you have the owner's contract. Technology is used where I think the account is not you know, because the reports are coming through that, yes, I think these are the contracts, this is how it's being done. I talked about all these things, the last, you know, topic, what I really want to, you know, just spend 10, 15 minutes and then we can have Q&A. What's the characteristics of effective technology there? There's so much of you know expectation from the you know from the interlocutors. So what is that the person should have? He or she should have the leader. Because at the end of the day, the interlocutor, at least in my mind, I've seen if you have a very effective interlocutor chief, that function, that particular unit will do extremely well. Otherwise, it will not. So at least we're talking about you know the five prerequisites for a leader to be very effective as interlocutors. I'll touch base on some things um, in terms of one position, vision, business line, and talent and communication. You know, the chief audit executive and stakeholders, I think we can just take one minute in terms of vision. I think as an auditor, I think, you know, chief auditors, you know, he needs to really have the vision which is aligned with the strategic objective of the businesses, which is extremely important. If you don't do that, I think you will not be able to understand the risk framework, the risk, uh, you know, entire inverse. And the stakeholder, what are they asking? Who are your interlocutor leader accountable for aligning the employee with the business strategy? So it's coming very clearly that you got to understand the business strategy of the leader, as an employer chief. Then only you to understand the risk. And then the second question, talent. Make certain your talent model can respond to organized and emerging risk. Do you have the enough breath? Do you have the enough you know, appetite to kind of you know manage to risk through a talent provider? Ensure you have fully communicated your expectation around employment talent and its potential value to employment and the broader stakeholder group. These are all the stakeholders asking, the audit committee, the board, the independent directors, regulators. The position, you are giving someone to respond to him, who does he have authority? At least here I'm happy, the law is taking its own course. At least law is now mandating an employer to become more and more independent, which is very good once again. And communication, which is once again impact, you know, very important as to how effectively you are communicating with your stakeholders. And business alignment, and how you really build the trust, going back to your question, on the CEO, how you build that trust in the business line. Because many times CEO thinks that's more mundane function. I think that's where the gap comes in. The other point which is increasingly becoming very, at least in the external world, is the cyber security. This risk is becoming unmanageable. So, Intelligence has been asked to really you know, spend a lot, lot of time in terms of cyber security risk and what the companies are doing. Uh, and, you know, if there are different uh, you know, technologies you know, companies are using as to how they are identifying. See, today when you talk about any businesses, the business accounting, you know, software is not increasingly communication with outside software, whether it's a bank software, you know, whether it's a vendor software, not challenges and this is not coming in that area. That focus is once again, you know, because employees are very good in understanding the system risk within the company. When the system talks to other system outside, those risks how are you going to communicate it? You know, because a lot of frauds are happening. Because increasingly today, I think how many people are issuing the check? It's online transfers. Your, your, your kind of system that are the bank system. Do you have enough understanding of all those? So some of these, I think, you know, are becoming increasingly important globally and India also is picking up in terms of that. So I think, you know, steps towards the future, just I think, you know, very, very highlight uh, is that, uh, you know, conduct internal and external quality reviews. When you do the audit, you need to have checks and balances, like in the engineering, at least the external audit environment is happening, both the internal and external quality review. Are you doing enough work? Whether the work what you have done is you know great quality, continuous quality improvement program for all employment locations. How do I really 
uh, what are my KPIs, where I'm doing very well, where I'm not doing very well. You can do through the, you know, um, also getting the feedback from others. Establishing quality guidelines is standard for work papers, not reports. Because, you know, work papers also, because sometimes <coughs> when the regulator comes in, <coughs> they obviously look for the work papers. <coughs> Whether you're done the F work or you're not done the F work. And perform multiple review of finding recommendation manufacturing plan prior to report issuance. <coughs> so you need to be very clear in terms of, uh, you know, what are the plans the management has to respond to this what you identified. Maintain continuous communication between the internal audit team and the AI, the audit team, the audit planning, which is also becoming extremely important because unless if you plan very well, it's very difficult for you to achieve that end objective. Develop a scorecard, <coughs> evaluating activity what you are doing, both in areas like the cost reduction, revenue enhancement, risk medication, and best practices. I think this is some of the <coughs> I think, uh, global best practices which are happening now. So if you have any issue, I'm happy to take that. <coughs> yeah. Regarding applicable table the principles of materiality, yeah. how the internal audit should be changed? Because audit is sometimes small things we grow, stating may not the material for the company. But the aggregated to take a small things it makes it into yeah. audit. See, increasingly, two, three things are happening globally in terms of in that area. One, on the audit findings relating to ethics, there is absolutely no material to answer reply. Absolutely no material. Even if the CL guy is dumping one particular product, you know, in the market, is taken very seriously. So, increasingly, audit committees are asking, or the boards are asking, anything relating to the ethics, there is no materiality at all. One rupee, fifty paisa, whatever, maybe there is no materiality at all. So this has been communicated in Indian context and not happening. But globally, absolutely clear direction. Whether it's CEO, CFO, or whether it's a junior guy, on ethics, you've got to make sure in what was the issue and how it's been dealt with that. At least our committee wants to highlight, get some of the highlight in that area. Second, legal non-compliances, there is once again no materiality threshold for audit committees are tolerating. They want to know even the smallest legal compliances, non -legal, legal non compliances. For example, to give in, um, you know, if you look at the, the US laws, there is one act called the FC, FCI, FCPA, basically Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. It doesn't really distinguish if you are, you know, bribing the government officials. Obviously, the company is in great trouble. So, I think the audit committees are clearly say that if there is a, a non compliance, it's going to be important. So, one is ethics, other is legal. Third issue which I said, you know, one of the, today I think the biggest dilemma when you sit on the board, even as auditors and auditors, which I spoke about in the earlier also the concept, sometimes it's extremely difficult to make a sound judgment between legal and ethical. Why I'm saying is that everything which is ethical is legal. Everything which is legal is not legal. I'm just forgetting once again everything I think this sometimes you know really everything which is ethical is not you know, it's legal always. Everything legal is not ethical. The distinction between ethical and legal and how much, you know, the leeway we are taking that. I mean, increasingly the audit is asking the difficult questions. I told example of the tax planning. Is it tax planning, tax avoidance? What's the final difference here? Once again, I think, you know, increasingly the focus is no value there. I think they want to look at. The rest of other things in terms of other areas. See, the internal auditor's materiality threshold, it's just not like a uh, statue auditor where I think you opine on the profit or loss. That's why you tend to take materiality based on your bottom line. But increasingly audit committees are looking for attributes. What they really do is they look at the risk assessment and they really see okay which are the top risk areas where I have to report all the matters to audit committee, whether it be got they'll agree after the audit committee. Then the remaining mundane matters, the audit committee probably will have their own you know, subcommittee, they look into that. So I think that's where the distinction in Indian context is not happening around because people tend to say just ignore it. But as an auditor, I think it's extremely important to understand, you know, how this whole materiality threshold, what is going to apply today, it looks like tomorrow. You know, it might be a big issue. Because the don't talk might be a trouble. You know, so I think that's, that's something which, you know, uh, if, if you believe the auditor is pointing to that, not it has impact this year, but it will have impact on the company's culture, the company's tone at the top, the company's risk assessment, the company's ethics, then you have to 
with both those foreign communities. Doesn't matter how you know how material or immaterial they are. So I think that's something which the world of seamless transactions uh, transaction has improved the growth. Yeah. Especially the biggest profit making companies. Or the largest profit making companies don't pay Tax in order, minimal tax. Yeah. Whether it is Google of the world or Apple, or if you take the first three or four biggest profit making companies. Yeah. Uh, what is the role of the internal auditors uh, in this? Uh, I, I have in this uh, a recent case of Apple. I have in this when to, uh, I mean, do away with that tax. But do you want to tax? Yeah. So, what is the responsibility of the internal auditors uh, with regard to, but we, in, this, in this case taxation, but there could be a, any other case, it could be a social responsibility case. None of the auditors have pointed out, or even eh, whether it is the statutory auditors or internal auditors. Yeah. So if, you, if you look at it, there are so many, whether it is an Australian case or whether it is a EU case, so many, uh, even Indian government is fighting, right? Yeah. See, and, of course, and what happens uh, now the levy, equalization levy, yeah. backdoor tax uh, take into the picture? See, ultimately it's extremely difficult to just pinpoint the companies. The biggest mess is created by regulators. In my mind, they are the biggest culprit. They decided tax levels. Now you are going after Switzerland. Why the hell you did not go to the ES bank? The question comes back to you, right? So it's not a problem for me alone. The biggest culprits are regulators. They allow countries to leverage what they want. Today they are talking about best. They realize that it's not possible to do that. So one aspect is the, because companies have taken a shelter because there was a legal window. So is it illegal or legal? Is it, is it shelter or? It's a tax plan given. Because secrecy law in Switzerland, it's still there. Now they are coming to the term. So who, why even, why I am, why even, why? The multinational organization never took Switzerland for granted. Why did they did not take Switzerland for task? They maintained 20 years, they allowed them to have secrecy laws. Suddenly you are working up today. So this issue is just not with companies. The broad issue is basically, it's a regulatory arbitrage. The way the regulations are framed. Now they are trying to address that issue. That's no, no, I don't think now also they are not trying to. No, I mean, even Indian government, what they do, if you, if you try and bring in 1 million dollars to India, Indian government is ready to leave citizenship. No, see, as recent as, right? No, that's problem probably not so going to you, go away. So, you can buy citizenship by paying just as little as one million dollars? No, I think see, that is something which is, you know, more, more when it comes to companies, actually that's fine. Is it not? See, for example, Germany, if they don't allow immigration, they'll die tomorrow. Japan, they have decided that we don't want immigration. They know that we will die old. That's a call country today. That is not a call which a company will take or a regulator will take or an will take or external will take. Whether immigration is required for you, Canada says yes, we both we need immigration. Germany says we need immigration. Japan says we don't. That is their description and the way they define. Now coming back to your question, the India is also talking about in a similar fashion. They think basically that as in we have to have a global mindset. Why people go back once again, why you just develop so fast? It has free movement of people. The whole idea is today, I think 60 to 70% of the idea is generated even from the US today. Because that's how they created the economy. Now that's your call whether you want to do that as a country. But coming back to your question, on the you know, tax level, it all started with the global arbitrage. See, when there is an arbitrage, when you can do something else. For example, in India, when the diesel car were banned in NCR, people started registering in That's a global, that's arbitrage. People used to register 2000 cc vehicle in mid and bring today. It's a nonsense way of doing things, right? So I think now they realize that. It's still all around the board. But still they have realized that this is not going to really work if we are going to at least let's have a common basic minimum standards. I think that's what they're heading towards, but it's not it's not going to happen you know, overnight. But as far as internal audit is concerned, what is more important? The more important for internal audit is not that the company should do X or Y. The implied goal is that whether the risk is articulated properly to the stakeholders. I think that's the key question you need to ask yourself. This risk has a flip side of it. Whether this risk is getting communicated with the impact, if at all it happens, with the 
stakeholders. I think they have your job for us. I think that's where we need to really think through whether the risk assessment, what the company is doing, what we are doing, and what you know risk the company is taking, how does risk looks in totality, and whether the downside of the risk assessment is known to stakeholders. I think that's where I think in my mind and internal auditors will add a lot of value. You want to have some external auditors also. Because increasingly if you really look at it, unfortunately if you look at auditing profession, in my mind auditing profession about auditing profession depends upon the two cornerstone. There are two fundamental cornerstones on which our profession is dependent on CS, especially the auditors. If you don't do this two, you know, co-activity properly, I don't think so will be relevant in the marketplace after 10, 15 years. We all be relevant. What are those two core principles? One core principle is skepticism. Are we exercising healthy skepticism? When I'm saying skepticism, I don't have a doubt on this integrity. Does it make my sense to my mind? So that is where implicitly related is asking auditors to do that too. Be skeptical because the skepticism has gone out of the window. That has to come back in our future. And that also has to come back in our curriculum, the way we are developing child accountants. Are we enough skeptical? That is point number one, which is one of the most fundamental causes to the profession. The second one is making a sound judgment. Friends, I think you know things are uncertain, right? So making sound judgment is very important. How do you make that judgment? is extremely important. And that will not come through reading books. That will only come through how you exercise your, how you really develop that judgment skill set. Because when you send, sign the financial statement, nobody can predict you after six months whether the company will survive or not today. Nobody can predict you. Even the company is sitting on a pile of cash. It's impossible. You know? So I think I'm making that judgment. For example, I'll tell you, one of the things which really hits me when I see the accounts, there's a wide gap between cash generation and profit. Your profit is one billion dollar, your cash generation is hundred million dollars. One billion dollar your profit, your profit is affecting one million dollar, but cash generation is hundred million. Do you survive? Cash is a threat, right? I might be making good profit on record through fair valuation, through so much accounting jiggly. Where is the money box? Where is the money cash? Where is the cash? That is something which worries me when I look at the accounts, real accounts. I keep asking this question. Where is the money here? Where is the money on the table? So I think some because once again I can't blame anyone, the accounting rules have changed. Half of your assets are going to get pay value, and pay value depends for the market. And tomorrow, market is not there. So you can't blame anyone in the whole process. So I think at least we need to understand. When I go back to audit committees and some of the presentation, I just try to highlight in the difference what they have in profit and cash condition. They have done everything fine. I have checked everything, it looks fine to me. But I am worried about next 12 months whether they will get the cash. So I think some of these things, you know, for, for our perspective, the risk assessment and risk mitigation and communicating the risk and assessing, you know, risk on your own work, whether you are comfortable, is a key question we need to ask. Because we have limited role to play. I don't think so only internal auditors and external auditors will uh, issue and risk carpet donors. In my mind, if we want to address the carpet donors, regulators have to play their role, board has to play their role, audit committee has to play their role, shareholders have to play their role, internal auditors have to play their role, external auditors have to play their role. Everyone has to play the role. Then only because you can't hold one guy responsible and shoot the gun on his head. Start from, which is what is happening today. Why are we not having a holistic solution? Because the problem is not fixed. In my mind, regulators play a critical role in anything what they do. If they don't get it right, I think this is wrong. So I think the limited question is that I think basically you have to go back and at least show the flip side of it. And then if they come to the board and audit to take that call, yes, this risk is acceptable to us. We want to do that because we have no other option. Today, I think where you are in you have not pointed at this. Maybe you knew the risk, but we did not point. I think mean, that's where the efforts are going by. Changing role of internal audit. Yeah. Topic of the day. What we have covered is on risk management and changing role of internal audit. There could be other changing roles. No, I think basically what's happening globally is that I think at the end of the day, one thing which is coming, as I said, two or three things are being. Let me finish. Yeah, that is one question. Second is, what should ICA do and what should internal auditors do in this change in the role of internal? Okay, I think I'll, I'll explain all those things. The change in the role of internal auditors is three gamut actually, which I talked about. The first and first most important for internal auditor. The whole topic, you know, why I focus on risk assessment was without risk, nothing you will be able to do that. 
That's the cornerstone for you to make sure, do you understand all the risk properly? Not the compliance risk, not the operational risk, not the financial risk, much beyond that. I think that's a key takeaway, which what I see globally in what's happening now, which has also come through the credit crisis, because people never understood risk management. The second one important thing is that, do you understand the governance enough? I know the risk now. I know the risk. Do you understand but the governance? It will also be partial. It may not be full. It may not be full. It may not be 100%. I think yes, it may not be governance, because when I know the risk, I know the risk. Then I know the risk management policy. So whether it might have limit policies or not policies, do I have the governance to monitor both these things? That is simple word I'm talking about. This is the core. Risk, risk management and governance. For example, if you believe the audit committee is not effective, what are you going to do there? Nothing you can do. If I know the board, board of directors, people come and have some chocolates and some biscuits and go, what is happening there? Nothing is going to happen there. This is the broader question I think we need to go back. So what is our goal? Our goal is at least to go back and say, boss, these are the things which are on the horizon. At least you will be able to defend tomorrow if the review comes in. I have told in the presentation to you fellows, long back, these are the risks which are under medicated. No, you are going to need that. You have announced the universal picture of the risk yeah. of that. So long this is, back, it was a... No, this uh, is where... Uh, you know, and now 15 years ago in the Chartered Accountant magazine itself. Yeah. No, but I think those risks are changing. The risks are changing rapidly. For example, I think there are many risks people never thought they would happen. Nobody expected 10 years back, Japanese annual appreciating in dollars. Nobody on the earth expected. It happened. It happened. So those are things which are happening. Nobody expected Britain will go through exit and pounds will be one of the biggest currencies in the world. Who expected it? So I think this, when it takes the risk lens, the risks are dynamic. They are just changing in rapid way. Nobody expected I will come to 30 dollars. Nobody expected. It was rolling for 20 years, more than 100 dollars. Can you hear me? And China was consumed like 3 million barrel to 11 million barrel, but still nobody expected. No shake understood what shale gas will do. So this is where it's impossible. If somebody tells me that I identify the risk, I have my own doubts. I have my own doubts. Because I don't think so you can ever do all the risk. Maybe you can go to greater degree in this way our efforts should come in, handy efforts. Because once you know the risk, then Risk management policy becomes, because as an intellectual or external auditors, who's going to be, we don't define the appetite of the goal. Because they are being asked to run the business. They have to invest. The investor is going to pay or not, nobody can tell with confidence or conviction. But at least they should know the downside of it. I think it's very more and more uh, in terms of the you know, risk and risk management. Effective governance culture is something which is important to have to really continue. Talk in terms of what's happening, you know, in different uh, you know, forums. But the good news is that today you are being facilitated by regulators. For example, I talked about audit committee reporting and auditors. Today, every country in the world requires audit board to evaluate. So in India, board doesn't evaluate. Companies have this, you know, request the board to evaluate the directors. But globally, companies are evaluating the board itself. How effective the board is. How you have to the audit committee? Because these are mandated now. So a lot of facilities in the regulation is also doing now for effective governance. Because they know that if internal auditor alone is going to do, it's not going to be effective because then they have to work with them. It's work with the company, right? You can't obviously take the CEO for uh, this. So I think that, that you know that's what supports available today. So in this whole thing, it's the internal auditors. What are you doing in terms of making sure? But more than that, the question also is that do you do enough for your own development? When you have so many challenges, are you developing enough for yourself? Do you have that knowledge, the breadth of knowledge with you? Whether the knowledge of economy, knowledge of industry, knowledge of your businesses, so that, that you can pinpoint something which is very, very strategic and important for your company. I think that's where the efforts are. Because standards are not so fine, I think you, you, you continue to do that. The CAA, what they should do for making us effective, and what internal auditors should do to in our curriculum. We have become too technical. That's why we are losing. At this point, can I add? Yeah. Internal auditors' role with regard to the eco uh, internal control or financial reporting at point and car over, right? So, how do you uh, can you add the on the ICA part? Yeah. See, I said two or three things are happening. Obviously, I think in Indian context, it's extremely very messy right now. 
because people are not really thought about wage structure really. Because that's, uh, I have seen you in the socks and man, the first one or two years, you will struggle to, you know, kind of. There are more questions predominantly people are asking is that basically, you know, most important thing is that how I am scoping my whole account balances. The, you know, business needs account balances, have a really, you know, kind of scoping is done properly or not, and it's extremely important there once again. Once you do your scoping right, and what is the objective there? The object is very simple, material statement. What is the material statement? Generally, is more once again. I think there's no state answer there. So, material statement, do I do net scoping properly? Then, what should control inverse is talk about? That's where I added now that today the ICFR model in Indian context is what can 15 years back had seen in the US. Predominantly, people have 90% of the controls which are operating only annually, not even monthly, not even monthly. Even exercise they can do books, we can do it annually. So, I think that's where now how it change basically because the quality of Today, the ICF has spent a lot more on the manual control and the quality of person what the company is having. So, that is now going to obviously change a lot in the future in terms of I talked about the automated controls, I talked about the preventive control because now the mix is going to shift. So, you will not see maybe I think 3, 4, 5 years. So, you would like to have as minimum as manual control possible, as large as detective control possible, and go most on automated control and preventive control. Because that's the only way in my mind you can address the risk of a deal statement. Because you can't depend upon detective control, you can't depend upon those. Once again, I came back. The thrust today is that nobody's interested to know after the event has happened. Nobody's interested. They are saying that tell me, it will hit me. You have a very knowledgeable person, you know the whole thing. Tell me and caution me is going to hit. I think for the question also, they ask the same thing also. In fact, the going concern standard globally is getting changed because our going concern standard is written maybe 30 years back. And we are doing the same going concern. And in going concern, we don't know how six months business will be there or not. Now, the retailers are open up that this standard with this no business failure can be identified. So, I think that's all the stuff which is happening around because now they are rewriting the entire standard. The whole pay violation model, the, you know, the whole uh, uh, the IFRS 109, which talks about the expected model, it's all happening because we all historically looked at the past and did the provisioning. We never looked at what is happening, going to happen tomorrow. But what is going to happen tomorrow has so much impact today. Now, whether that's going to be work, we have to just see it in the valuation models are very complex. And unfortunately, it's extremely difficult to predict this, you know, what's going to happen with so much uncertainty happening now. So I think things are going to change, standards are going to change, the standards are being rewritten. In fact, the PCO auditing standards on the fair valuation, they are taking to different aspects altogether. Our auditing standards more with the, we are, you know, aligning the entire authority standard. But the US is rewriting the entire standard because they, they felt there are some sort of gaps in that. So they are going to look at it. So it's increasingly going to evolve. The only thing, the, the table for me is what I think is that, what I think when I really think, am I agile to know the risk? Do I know enough or do I need to consult someone? Do I have the expertise or do I don't have expertise? So I think more and more that question we need to ask and then we need to ask, have you done enough work in this area? You know, in terms of what will we do? We do enough work or we are not doing enough work. And if you are not doing enough work, where are we missing? Do I have that capability to do that? So those are the bigger questions that we need to all ask. Basically, and now coming back to the curriculum. <coughs> Unfortunately, what you learn today after 10 years at we learned, all accounting principles will change. I can tell you that much. Whatever, because I, when I did my BCom, I never knew fair valuation. I knew historical concept, how much I paid as record and then I will keep quiet. Today is starting because the man is well now. So tomorrow what is going to happen? What are we doing? Nobody knows. So I think the more important is that, see, what is the technical aspect? In my mind, I think the global equipment is extremely important to back up this technical equipment. If you don't have that, you will become a silo. And the silo approach is what we need to avoid. We need to look at how can we bring that edge. If you look at the VA and all this, they are going and attacking that, that edge. There is a person, a leader, does he understand the global implication of what's happening around on his profession? I think that's something, obviously, I think the ICA also, uh, recently, I think, they did some survey. In fact, they're part of the survey, I think, no feedback. Well, you're doing very well, but you need to talk of that. You know, you can't expect, you know, people to operate this. Because the other thing I'll tell you, this is my personal view, which I have learned very hard. Thank you. Your knowledge has to be scalable. Today, external auditors and internal auditors are very, very comfortable talking to CFO. If you want CFO, they'll start making. Because you don't have that knowledge to ask that question. You see the promoters, he, he doesn't talk about your impairment, 
to listen to the pen. So he is minus 100 as only. You got to have that knowledge. You have to scale. That's why we need to all work towards. Are we scalable enough? Can I have a conversation with a promoter in his own library, CEO in his own library, CEO in his own library, account in his own library? That's how I think. If I'm not, then I can go and protect myself before I go to the meeting. Thank you. Along with changing the role of internet auditors, your point of purpose of life is not only making money, it's only one of the purposes really of great sense. Thank you so much, Honorable Bandler Branch, for giving a wonderful presentation. We a round of applause. I know if you see the Nayak SMJ, can we come forward and present a moment as a token of appreciation and gratitude for uh, taking time out of this busy schedule? Big round of applause. Thank you, Vinayak sir. On 9th September, that is on Friday, we have tax planning on uh, direct taxes on latest case clause analysis between 6 pm to 8 pm in the same uh, branch premises by seeing Arindra J. J. interested in this candidate button. Thank you.